So, hello, everybody. Uh, some of you, some of you, I slightly recognise or would have bumped into on various occasions. Uh, and sorry if I keep looking my looking up because my work computer is misbehaving. Uh, and some strange things seem to be going on. But anyway, and some of my notes are probably on it, so I'm going to have to busk it. Right. Anyway, okay. So I, as uh, some of you know, transport. I've been working in Transport Scotland for some time now. Uh, the job description when I started, I suppose, was policy on bus services and travel concessions, uh, particularly for bus. Uh, it, we've evolved over the years, so I'm uh, my team I used to head up has expanded and my job has been split. Uh, and some of the things I used to deal with have now, we used to deal with as a bus issue, have now moved across to other colleagues. So, for example, the climate change stuff is uh, the, the electric vehicles and hydrogen and so on, which we used to have a have an interest in from a bus perspective now has a whole directorate of its own driving a low carbon economy as it relates to transport we're interested and we are plugged into that to some extent because some of our funding streams support that but the lead on that is elsewhere uh, transport scotland has also got a much beefed up central sort of transport strategy uh, function now looking across a piece at, across modes you know historically rather like dft in london we used to be a bit modal siloed uh but uh and you know still to have that slight tendency but we do have a sort of stronger strategic sort of bit of the organization now so some issues are being sort of dealt with primarily as a as an overall cross-cutting overarching type issue with us feeding in because obviously the particular particular modes still present very particular issues because they're quite divergent uh we've all been working uh, almost entirely from home since uh, since whenever it all kicked off, March or whenever it was. I, I seem to remember, I think a colleague of and I gave evidence in Parliament one day. I think about the next day I popped in. I was sort of told, don't come into the office after this. Uh, and then I, I think I popped via the office to pick up some IT kit. Uh, and that is the last I have seen of the office and the last I have seen of any colleague physically in the flesh, apart from one whom I bumped into in the street in Edinburgh the other day. Uh, I'm actually spending most of the time working from home in the Highlands, so uh, so I'm sort of uh, up in up in Maggie's part of the world uh, most of the time. Although I I do have to go down to Edinburgh for some uh, for some things uh, not work related. Right. Anyway, uh, I was asked to say a few words about big about sort of what we were up to. Uh, so. And there's a sort of mixture there. There's the, some of the big picture stuff I mentioned uh, is sort of alluded to is does involve us. Uh, we are either trying to get stuff into it or trying to keep stuff out of it or trying <laughs> trying to influence it from the bus point of view. Uh, so big stories around there of national transport strategy where the de there's another delivery plan due to be produced. Uh, I think by the end of the year, around about the end of the year, I think Rachel may be plugged into that process as, as are we to some extent they're taking quite a non-modal approach to this so so in a sense it's sort of slightly from our point of view high level and aligned with what we're trying to do but not necessarily then going into great detail about how that impacts say on the bus sector and so on but we're trying to make sure that it, it sort of has the sort of messages we want to see in it and, and the priorities that we want to see and we think bus bus hits and as you say, in community transport is a sort of shared public transport type mode. It ticks quite a lot of boxes in terms of priorities for the uh, transport strategy. Uh, obviously, one of the, the changes we published a transport strategy. So we're now talking about the delivery plan, the annual delivery plan. And, and that was due out, I think, in May, no, due out in the summer rather. And it's been put back. And it's obviously now got to look at life as it's been infected by COVID which uh, complicates life. It doesn't mean that we're not still trying to do the things we were trying to do, but how easy we are to do has, and how you do them has possibly changed somewhat. <clears throat> climate change. Uh, there's a climate change plan update due, I uh, think, to be laid before Parliament in middle of December, uh, still being very actively uh, worked on. Uh, we've got, I mean, very big, uh, very ambitious statutory targets to cut carbon and then within that big ambitions to cut carbon from the transport sector that's most of the carbon uh, emissions from the transport sector are driven by cars internal combustion engine powered uh, individual car use if you like 
uh, but all the bits of transport are being looked at hard to see what they can contribute to the mix. Obviously, from a bus and public transport point and wider public transport point of view, uh, we, we're we trying to sort of, there's a sort of two things going on. One is people are very, very eager to uh, green the fleet. Uh, and that, obviously, that's also, if you've seen from announcements down south with the uh, Prime Minister's 10-point plan, which I haven't had time to look at them yet, but, uh, but which we'll be obviously seeing, you know, which bits apply here and which bits don't apply here, but no doubt we would wish to surpass in Scotland. Uh, but greening the fleet is one thing, uh, but the other, but we're also very anxious that the other contribution of the public transport system, which is modal shift away from car and enabling that isn't, isn't lost sight of. And, you know, there's a bit of complementarity between the two because, you know, arguably nice green, nice green vehicles are attractive and get people onto them. But there's also a tension because if you make people spend an awful lot of money on greening their vehicles, that has to come from somewhere and if we're not paying for it then it has to come from customers or local authorities and it comes out of the budgets that pay for services so uh so trying to get that balance between greening the thing as fast as possible whilst making it you know attractive to people to use and keeping it in being is uh is, is going to be a bit of a challenge and covid has been complicating that uh to come back to covid funding uh there's also we've got quite a lot of we I mean the bus bus units collectively so I'm speaking partly about units which I don't head anymore I've also got uh, quite a lot to do on the bus legislation front uh, the Transport Act which got Royal Assent to back in whenever November back of last year uh, but which hasn't yet been commenced uh, certainly not on our side anyway and there's discussion we would I think have been expecting to be fairly hard at work on commencement so guidance and legislation needed to bring it into force uh, over the course of this year like a lot of other things that's been backburnered by covid partly because we have been working on other things uh, and the people we'd have to deal with also been working on other things but it is being warmed up and picked up again and some bits of the uh, act are being our uh, people are pressing for movement on uh, particularly uh, on our side i think the local authority powers to run their own services or to own their own service operations uh but so that's that being looked at and i was reminding myself of course we have the health board duties provisions in the act as well which uh which are in that list of things to be brought in workplace parking levies pavement parking a lot of as well as for bus partnerships bus franchising and uh bus bus data and smart ticketing and so on so that was sort of that was all big stuff we were going to be doing anyway and that's all big stuff that's still being done but against the background of covid which has sort of delayed it but also changed the changed the context to which we're trying to do it uh i basically have been spending certainly the first how many months is lockdown started almost entirely on covid emergency funding for services uh, so the COVID support grant and the COVID support grant restart, uh, sort of, God knows where we came up with those titles. Uh, but then which began with the commitment to uh, maintain the level of BSOC and concessionary travel payments at previous levels, effectively regardless of what was actually happening in terms of mileage and patronage, uh, although we did have to attach some mileage conditions uh, for sort of state aid and other reasons, procurement reasons. So there's a CSG has a fairly low bar set in terms of mileage to be operated and we're fairly relaxed about people running less than that if they've got good cause. Uh, Covid's CSGR which is the much bigger package which then came in when we when we moved from just trying to keep operators in being and keep a very basic network going whilst full lockdown was in place we then needed to ramp up services because we thought people can start traveling again and so we uh, found money to pay for that. Well, I say we found money, we are spending money on it. And at some point, my Scottish government finance colleagues are going to have to work out how we're going to pay for it because there wasn't a giant pot of unallocated money for this sort of thing. Uh, we're getting some consequentials from the UK government, but there's an ongoing discussion about how many. Uh, it's not, all, not always very clear. But anyway, we are funding it. Uh, we're doing it with, we have big, those of you who've got, I don't know if any of you actually will have contracts. I think take up is obviously more, it's more geared up for larger operators but but basically uh we have big scary contracts uh we are requiring people to run quite a lot of 
services as measured by kilometers. Uh, we went up to as near as you can get to 100. We pushed it back down a bit, partly for reasons of affordability for us. And we are basically paying uh, operators to do that uh, on a no profit net cost basis. And the largest operators are, have just been going through a fairly heavy duty reconciliation process to check that we, uh, whether they owe us money or we owe them money, we make regular payments and then we either claw back or top up. We're going to be clawing back quite on quite a large scale because actually there'll be more passengers than we budgeted for and a few other things different. Smaller operators, I think we're doing a more of a risk-based audit. So, uh, you know, some operators will have been clawed over, others we're asking to sort of explain to us the figures. That, so that's, so just, we had, uh, I think uh, last month we extended that budget. We're getting that money in sort of a few months at a time at the moment. So we got an extension to that budget until the middle of January. We've just sent out the contractual revisions to the largest operators and we're about to start sending them out to the smaller operators. It's, just, it's largely contract as before, although I think we put a bit more emphasis on rural connectivity in the language, although in practice it's not a hard obligation. Uh, and we're now uh, sort of head down trying to work out how much money we will need from January, mid-January onwards, assuming things carry on as they are. Uh, so there's, there's a bidding process and we have to decide that by, I think 18th of December is the deadline for us to tell people if the scheme is going to continue or not. Uh, and obviously, whether it continues or not, is depends on whether we get agreement to more money, uh, which hopefully we will. But it's, it's a slightly uncomfortable position, obviously, for people receiving this stuff because we can potentially turn off the taps at four weeks' notice, which obviously you know would be quite problematic if we did. But equally, it's taking uh, a lot of money. I'm just looking at this. The, I mean, other COVID-related work, which I've not been closely involved with. Uh, to the same extent, but which other colleagues are leading on are around things like messaging on public transport use. Are we telling people not to use public transport or are we just telling, you know, we tried to avoid that sort of messaging. Uh, and I think we we're quite pleased we did avoid that sort of messaging, but nevertheless, it creeps in a bit. People are slightly scared of public transport. We are discouraging people from inessential travel. And then, if, then we are encouraging people to active travel if they can. So clearly, the messaging and, and the demands of COVID are having a downward impact on patronage. I mean, the other if, the other problem which the operators face is the fact that if you're going to have distance to people on a bus, you can't carry many people on a bus compared with normal. Now on us, that's fine if your buses weren't very full initially, but for those services which were busy, even with depressed patronage, they might be under pressure. So some services operators are having to double up, you know, and run two buses from um, the time, time slot and so on, if that's an urban area problem. Uh, we're sort of starting to think about where all this goes next. That's that's going to be the big issue is about, you know, as things start to, we can't carry on funding like this. Uh, a, it's costing us a lot of money and, and B, apart from anything else, operators are not making, allowed to make any profit at the moment, which means there is no money for investment. And, you know, and if, if you thought this was an indefinite state of affairs, you would be, you would be rather eccentric to be running a bus company at the moment because why? Uh, so I think there has to be an assumption we have to start moving at some point back to a situation in which, you know, operators are allowed to, presumably will have to take risks and can may make profits and then can invest in things, including the shiny new green buses, which we want to see people buy. Uh, and we're looking at this across a piece because I think it's not just bus that is facing this, but it's playing out in a sort of slightly different way with rail and it's playing out with ferries and probably to a lesser extent lifeline air services i think but certainly ferries ferries to some extent and definitely rail we are to some extent we're all competing for money and competing for patronage and dealing with similar problems uh the one of the things which we had delayed while all this was going on was the commitment the government gave uh i think in february uh, around about the budget time uh to introduce if it could free bus travel for under 19s uh and the announced intention was to do that if possible by January, January coming. Uh, that's not going to be possible, uh, but what we are, but we have picked that up and we are now running with it as fast as we can with a view to legislating early in the new year before the election, uh, which is going to shut down legislative time, uh, with a view to introducing the thing later in the next year. And it's, uh, it's quite, it's, quite a big project with a lot of us involved in it with 
we've sort of set up our project structures. We've got to deal with people like NECPO, the local authorities who issue things, the Young Scott who have uh, the model say and influence involvement with the Young Scott card, which is likely to be at least part of the basis of this. But almost the biggest logistical headache is actually getting car ha getting cars to people because uh, we're dealing with about 770,000 people. Uh, over 400 or so cars I think have cards already, but they're slightly different purposed cards. Uh, and then the younger age group, we don't have cards. And we think we need to do this through smart cards uh, for reasons of sort of monitoring and fraud prevention and so on. But that's actually a fairly major logistical task. There's a lot of IT systems involved. So this is potentially involves quite a lot of IT system changes, uh, which is always a recipe for <laughs> recipe for risk. Uh, and it involves systems we don't control, which are run by the local authorities, for example. And two of the major systems involved are undergoing major procurement or have been undergoing major procurement exercises. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a perfect storm in some ways. Uh, we're doing a public consultation. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's somewhere on Citizen Space. Uh, if you haven't commented, feel free. As of yesterday, we had 1,356 responses yesterday morning, uh, which is quite a lot. I mean, there was a point just after we launched this consultation, not that we're competitive, when we had 880 responses and colleagues on Roadworks regulation had one to a consultation that they had done. Now, I'm not exactly surprised I've done Roadworks, but uh, we are getting a hell of a lot of responses. Uh, probably most of them are from young people saying it would be a jolly good idea to give me free bus travel. Uh, but there are more nuances than that. Uh, I just realized I'm ignoring the chat bar, but no, no, that's okay. Good, thank you. Yes, the consultation has been circulated. Uh, so that's my that's my newest, newest, biggest headache. Uh, although the, the emergency funding stuff is continuing. Uh, not me, but a thing that had been delayed and for us is a very big story is the bus partnership fund. So this was a really big announcement, I think, last autumn of uh, over 500 million pounds over a slightly unspecified length of time, but over a number of years. Primarily for infrastructure, bus priority and similar infrastructure. Uh, the thing it's trying to deal with is the impact of congestion on services because we're going to have belief that at least for urban and very urban areas one of the biggest problems for running bus services effectively and punctually and all the rest of it at the moment is congestion uh and the big it we pinned it to partnership in the sense that we want people to come up with stuff that basically builds in both local authorities commit to do things as the managers of roads and so on and bus operators who are going to be given a better operating environment uh, commit in turn to do things that they can do so you know, make services more frequent, extend services, clean up their vehicles, train their staff better, whatever, you know, uh, but with an emphasis on local local initiative to actually come up with this. So the operating local authorities need to get together and work out what, what would work. And and we inject money. Uh, we also, I think, are giving some support to operators and partnerships to come up with ideas there. Some criticism, this is a central belt focused thing, uh, not intended to be. Uh, it's interesting, I think one of the best examples we've so far found of anybody working on all this is actually the Inner Murray Firth partnership. So, which, although having said that, having done tourism, I know that sometimes uh, from a Highland perspective, Inverness feels like the centre. So, uh, so kind of the central belt, uh, but it is, you know, it's not exclusively central belt and we are, we are dependent on the quality of what people come up with, but we are trying to push that. That has restarted. We had a sort of temporary pop-up type bus partnership thing during during lockdown, but now we're moved to actually now let's get people starting to build it and so on. It ties in with the new legislation I talked about because that has new statutory partnerships and so on in it. There's been some criticism, but this is, uh, you can only do this if you're in partnership with private sector operators, uh, which we have said is not, not the case. We're not bothered about who owns the operators, but we do want partnership with the services because it is about the people who manage the roads and the people who run the services having a sort of joint vision and commitment and so on. Uh, so Lobian, for example, we would we'd want to see something from, we would want to see stuff from Edinburgh. We would want to see Lobian, Lobian on board with that as well as councils. Uh, rural services continues to be a sort of challenge to which we continue not to have an easy answer. Uh, I think a, a small bus operator once said to me the answer is resource, revenue funding. Uh, 
which is sort of what we've, we always say to each other and is the bit of funding which under normal circumstances we find if is in scarce supply and what we have of it is most committed already to things. So for example, some years ago, we looked at the concessionary travel scheme and could we raise the age limit, which would release, reduce costs there, freeing up stuff, freeing up revenue. I mean, I don't think we're in a position to say where that revenue would go, but certainly I would have liked to have snagged some of it for other aspects of public transport support. But in any case, it, that did not happen. We pushed back on that. Can we push to questions? We can jump to questions anytime now. Yep. So I think I had just about got to my end. So, and I think then, yeah. That's really Too helpful. Waffle. Sorry, just... sorry, Rachel. I thought I'd no, never not at all. Not we at all, busy not <laughs> I was going to say, I think from my perspective, it just shows how much stuff you guys have got going on. So we are enormously grateful for just an hour of your time because you and the team have just been flat out since, well, it feels like forever now, but it would just be, I think, really great to, to get through the, the questions and, and then potentially just come back if there are any other elements that people do want to focus on. Ema, shall I hand over to you? Sure. Um, Tom, thank you very much for that update. It was really useful and really interesting. Um, so, as Rachel mentioned earlier, we're going to focus on the questions that were, were, were submitted before the meeting, if we have time at the end to get through some others, and if anyone have questions that arise during the meeting, feel free to email them through to Rachel and I or pop them into the chat function and we will get back to you and pass them through to Tom. Um, before I hand over to the members asking questions, I just please ask you to introduce yourself and the organisation that you're representing. So firstly, we're going to hand over to Thurston, who has two questions. So Thurston's first question is about BSOG provision and his second question is about electric vehicles. So. Thurston, when you're ready. Afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Ema says, I'm Thurston Hodge. I come representing the Borders Community Transport Partnership. Um, the operator I'm involved with is Bedex for Wheels and uh, also just recently made project as well. Um, the two questions I have, so the one relating to BSOG is, do we have any idea from Transport Scotland about BSOG provision in the 2021 period? So it'll be 2021, 22. And um, if you just want me to ask my second one, um, is Transport Scotland have offered support for commercial operators switching to electric vehicles, which also includes alternative fuel vehicles? Um, will similar support be offered to community transport um, operators and also including charging points and refueling infrastructure in relation to alternative fuels? Yeah. Okay, uh, BSOG first. Uh, sorry, I'll just go back to gallery view. Uh, because I said the, uh, we are starting to think about what we do next. Uh, we've been on a bit of a roller coaster since March in terms of these sort of 12, 8 week, 10 week cycles of funding. Uh, but as I said, I think we can't carry on on this basis. Uh, BSOG has been suspended uh, while we've been doing this, not, not for any particular reasons of science just i think it's one less one simpler task for uh, my administrative scheme administration colleagues who having to run csg csgr ncts payments and you know and if bsog was going on as well we'd be having to run that uh so we have suspended it we have actually restarted it in the case with one operator who's new to the market who uh who we decided actually made point we probably should should have an, an a bsog offer uh, because we have a grant so basically tied to paying you what on the basis of what you did last year, which obviously if you were around last year, there's a basis. If you weren't around last year, there's no basis to give you any money. Uh, so and we thought it was reasonable to allow new entrants to claim BSOG on the old basis. So we're trying to do that, but it's not a, we're not expecting many people to enter the market at the moment for obvious reasons. Uh, next year, uh, I don't know. We're going to revert. We're going to have to change to something else. I don't know when, how quickly we'll be in a position to do that. Uh, the budget, I mean, I think we would argue certainly that the amount of money that goes on BSOG should be maintained. Uh, what exactly we use it to pay for, whether we go back to BSOG as it was, BSOG at a different rate, or BSOG for something else, I think is still to be decided. Uh, we have, I think, committed or undertaken to maintain some of the low carbon incentives in BSOG, uh, because I think they're part of the package which we're trying to encourage people to get vehicles with uh 
but the basic the basic rate you know the payment per kilometers uh that might come back or we might look or we might build we might fold that money into something else some larger funding scheme with some slightly different criteria but i mean i think we we still want something that does the things that vsog did support the network sort of including sort of less well-used services and the rest of it and we still want at least the same quantum but but it may be more because i say at the moment we're having to top top up those that money that subsidy to keep the uh, plug the fare box gap and so on i don't know when we'll have the answer to that uh, at the moment i say our focus is on making sure we have money beyond january mid-january uh, but i think the intention is to uh, do is, and as I say, part of a wider look at how we fund public transport and what we need and how much we need to fund public transport next year. We're, we're trying to think as well about how we think demand is going to return because that obviously has a big impact. Vaccines is interesting and so on. How quickly will that make a difference? But also, people may be more, people will be more reluctant to use public transport than they were before all this. And evidence from elsewhere, like bomb, the bombs in London and so on, suggests that it can take a number of years for people to get back to normal if you like whatever normal is in terms of demand so we anticipate that life will still be harder in terms of passenger sales and so on uh for for a number of years but hopefully not as hard as it is at the moment uh, in terms of depressed patronage so that's that's a non-answer on BSOG uh <laughs> but you know I think we're convinced we need the money here just probably exactly how we're going to allocate it uh, supporting for switching to EVs and so on. Uh, I think my colleagues would say we the focus, I guess, is on things like the bus, the various bus Suleb schemes and so on, and BSOG incentives I talked about. Those are we don't, those are sort of neutral as to the type of organisation that owns the vehicles. But, you know, we're not bothered. We can take local authorities. I think about Suleb's. I, I think third sector groups either if they haven't had, they could have had. They could have applied for Sulebs and so on. Um, it's not. It's only a top up. It's only a portion of additional costs. You still have the money to buy an extra vehicle, which obviously is an issue if you haven't got that money around. Uh, but there's no bar in principle uh, to that. Uh, I my low emission colleague. Sorry, I'm looking up because I've got a screen above me. <laughs> is there? So they have a low carbon travel and transport challenge fund. I think is there, which is things like infrastructure i think particularly so to get charging points in and so on primarily ev but i think as a they sell me this potential to support other other stuff the energy saving trust is running that for us i think it has an annual funding round and i think we just had round three which is in the means there isn't is in open at the moment but I, I think the plan is to continue it and grants are available to third sector charity business and and, and householders to install chargers and so on to support fleets uh hydrogen so i can't remember is this be moving on uh, and there's a different question about hydrogen sorry first and do, yes. do you have a specific concern about what we're up to which i haven't really answered no i think my largest concern was just kind of we were we're very aware that we've had our payment in october that we expected to have in april so we've had the funding ahead of time which is fantastic but come april we're very unlikely to get anything else so we have a massive gap in the funding which we're going to have to try and patch if you if you see what I mean um so it was just to kind of see if there was any indication from yourselves around an idea of when we would hear a decision but obviously that's still ongoing so we're not going to have anything just now so we'll just have to yeah. see. maybe catch up on separately on the, on the sort of timing point there I'm not quite clear I follow it because I mean basically the plan is this financial year unless something unless we run out of money no, I think even then, probably this financial year, you will by the end of this financial year, you should have got in BSOG what you should have got, what you would have expected to have got this year, had had it, had you been running all your services at the levels pre-COVID levels. So, if that leaves you in a in a, I don't know, it leaves you with lost revenue because people aren't travelling. That's that's yeah, I accept that. We're not plugging that with CSG. We're just we're just maintaining the BSOG payments. But if you think you'll end up with less BSOG this year than you would have expected then i'm i'd be slightly surprised so that maybe i don't think it's that we're expecting to have, end up with less it was just that we got the csg early so we have an expect what we did expect around that time is all ah, right timing. so it just causes a concern around how we manage yeah. our funding and internally okay cash if you like yeah that's yeah, yeah. like yeah because i can remember because sometimes we have this thing where operators some some operators in commercial actually don't want the money up front which I think, you know, you think, why not? But then I think it's sort of it. 
I suppose it then creates a cash cash flow management thing, which is sort of in theory easier, but I guess yeah, you do have to keep an eye on it. I take the point. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm and the um, we're going to move on to um, Terry Hagerty, who has a question about hydrogen vehicles. Terry, if you're ready. Hello. I was interested to know, uh, you, you mentioned hydrogen vehicles already in terms of mm. decarbonising transport. Uh, there are still some places in remote rural Scotland where grid connections for renewable energy schemes are lacking and yet we could be producing local energy with battery technologies or as they are in Orkney uh, by creating hydrogen technologies and I wondered if the Scottish government or you have a particular take on the extra value you might get out of investing in hydrogen transport. Hard to, hard to invest big extra money at this stage of COVID, but on the other hand, at this stage of climate change, it might be a great idea. Yep. Okay, that's, that's interesting. The, uh, um, I think uh, sort of hydrogen sort of seems to, when I, when I was sort of dealing with the bus, low, low carbon bus stuff, uh, usually sort of everybody's doing batteries and diesel electric hybrids, and, but then they moved on to batteries. and and depending on which engineer you talk to, you've got people who are very into the batteries, and then you and then we started to come across engineers who were absolutely fanatical about hydrogen, including the ones who worked for the companies that, uh, up until that point, were basically selling battery buses. So, so you know, the, the, it moves a bit. We we did do work on uh, there was we ETS was doing work on hydrogen buses, the Aberdeen stuff particularly as part of the European funded thing. Uh, Hydrogen was more advanced on things like bus than it is on smaller vehicle uh, than it is on smaller vehicles, and I think that's a technical thing, uh, just an engineering thing. There's also, I think, an economic thing that certainly the bus stuff. Part of the idea was to create a a local hydrogen infrastructure, so you create a demand which would then encourage you, which would then enable you to put in generation capacity, which would then allow you know the the hydrogen economy to grow locally, and that's still, I think, what they're trying to do. Uh, I think, I mean, I think we see this, what I have been told is I think we do think hydrogen has a lot of potential. Uh, I suppose the question of it may be different places and different different modes or different vehicle types may, you know, one may be better than the other. The and hydrogen is obviously, as I think for reasons you said, there's an obvious attraction to it when you're looking at uh, more rural areas, less less populated areas and so on, and less less well, well grid connected areas. I mean, I mean, I'm looking at the statement about ending the sale of petrol and diesel cars, and uh, and I and I and I stay in a property with no off-street parking in the Highlands, you know. And I'm wondering how is that going to work for me? Uh, and and you can see see there where hydrogen might work. So I think we uh, the general party line I think is around propulsion technologies are a matter of operator choice, and we're trying to be technology neutral. Having said that, I think we're also uh, funding hydrogen projects. There's uh, apparently was funding in the budget for hydrogen demonstrator product projects. There's we're spending some money at St Andrews on something called the hydrogen accelerator, whatever that is. But I think again, it's to try and create skills and technologies and so on. The hydrogen area, we are funding the hydrogen buses. I don't know that anybody's producing hydrogen cars or hydrogen light vans or minibuses at the moment. But you know, as and when, I uh, and I'm aware of. I mean, I can remember some years ago I was doing sustainable development, and at that time, my my my, my uh, senior boss was very excited by a project on either Yell or Unst, I think it was, which was basically using locally generated hydrogen to fuel a community car. I think mean, they could do it there because it wasn't connected to the rest of a road network, so I don't think usual roadworthiness legislation applied, uh, and they also had a hell of a lot of wind. Uh, but you know, in principle, it's there. I think yes, we're attracted by it. We are. We are putting money into hydrogen as well as, oh yeah, and I'm told we're also doing, yeah, we've got consultants advising on a project to sort of on the infrastructure and the grid and so on for hydrogen. So I think it's yes, we're, we're trying to do hydrogen as well. Brilliant. I, I neglected to introduce myself. I'm from the uh, Southwest Mull and Iona Community Transport Scheme. So uh, oh, yeah. 
if all of that money that's being spent on petrol and diesel to get people out to visit us was instead invested in renewable energy that was maybe community led, then we've got a circular economy thing going. And maybe that's particular to Ireland, so I don't know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, sorry to be moving you on quickly, but we have so many questions to get through. Um, so next, we'll come to Nick. Nick, you have a question about infrastructure for electric vehicles. Hi. Um, sorry about that today. I couldn't find my mouse. Um, so I'm looking at two screens and it disappeared off the corner. Hi, um, I'm Nick Cole. I run the Blagaran Industry Next Steps, um, which is a health and social um, minibus run service. A lot of the lot of the debate um, up to now has actually answered or well contributed to some of my um, concerns about the infrastructure. Um, but just picking up on one thing you re just said, um, you are investing in in Aberdeen to in, to introduce a local hydrogen infrastructure as a pump, basically as a pump priming and encouraging people to move. Why can't we not do the same um, route of the rest of the country? Because the the one of the principal, in fact, if not the principal reason for not taking up alternative fuels of any sort is the lack of available infrastructure at the potential destinations you go to. So whenever you're trying to plan things, you have to think about making a one-off round trip to get back to your, your charging point. You don't have any alternative options practically, particularly in rural areas, to uh, recharge for battery, level, let alone hydrogen, which is obviously more suitable for large vehicles anyway. Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, I say we, I mean, we have invested quite a lot of money in the, the electric in the electric charging points and so on. Okay. Uh, over the length of time, we are the low carbon travel and transport fund I mentioned is also, I think, funding people to put stuff in locally. Uh, so we're going to that. So the hydrogen one is, I mean, it's a bit different because I think the sheer cost of setting the thing up, certainly on any scale, and um, the project I mentioned is, I think, EU funded as part of an EU wide initiative to fund large projects to create local carbon, local hydrogen economies. Uh, so you needed quite a lot of demand for that. Uh, I mean, I remember when we looked at it from a bus point of view, there was no way we would have been funding that as a bus policy because the cost per vehicle was eye-watering, you know. So, so, it, but it was there to to pull the technology, if you like, the, the hydrogen technology through rather than to provide greener bus services as such, because we are very much cheaper ways of doing that. Uh, but yeah, no, we are. I mean, we would say we're doing it. Uh, are we doing it fast enough? Are we spending enough money on it? Uh, are we doing it well enough? I, you know, you may have a view on that, but uh, not really qualified to judge. I was just looking at the uh, charging network a bit earlier, partly with partly with this morning's announcement on and my own circumstances. Thinking if I had an electric car now, how would I cope? Uh, and at the moment, I wouldn't cope very well. Uh, so there's still a lot more work to do. Uh, I think that's I think that's the point, and people um, sort of missing it. Petrol and diesel didn't really take off until there are lots of petrol stations everywhere and exactly the same thing is going to happen with EV or whatever alternative fuels are and a lot of people seem to forget that it takes something like five minutes to put seven or eight hundred kilowatt hours worth of energy into a petrol or diesel car um, and yet it takes something like 10 to 12 hours typically to do the same in an electric car so a hand two or three charging points in a village here and there isn't going to is going to go nowhere near meeting any potential demand. And if you think about a petrol station which has maybe eight pumps available, eight slots, um, that can service you know a couple of hundred cars an hour in refueling. Whereas an equivalent of eight charging points is going to take the best part of a day, and then people have got to hang around while they're while it's happening. So there's an awful lot of more practical thought needs to be put into the infrastructure and, and my initial question was really linking was wondering how well you're negotiating with your other colleagues in both um, wider transport but also in terms of the energy infrastructure and I think there's yeah. a big we're missing a big point there because without the ability to recharge or refuel people are just not going to buy the vehicles yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're rehearsing a conversation I used to have with my low carbon 
my electric vehicle colleague uh, a few years ago on, uh, on that almost every occasion. Uh, I think we are spending a lot of work is going on to it. I think the people who are doing this know, know this is an issue. Uh, I've got a briefing note that talks about all sorts of money going on on, on uh, strategic partnerships with the energy networks to deliver EV infrastructure. I know from having talked to First Glasgow who have brought in some electric vehicles uh, they've been partly funded by uh, probably whichever one it would be, Scottish Power probably, or might be SNC. Uh, they, part of that was putting in charging capacity at the depot, the charging capacity for a not especially large number of buses uh, involved a significant upgrade in the local charging infrastructure. Uh, this is the sort of thing that's easier in some ways for us to do with large vehicles and large companies uh, because you just basically have to work with a few players. You just basically bus and buses are in some ways easier because buses usually start and stop at the same place and they're usually out for the day and then they go back or they may come back during the day so you can charge them like that. Freight is more difficult because it often starts in one place and ends up in a completely different place, you know, the next day. Uh, cars are problematic because there's a very, very large number of them, uh, basically. And if you're trying to do car climate change, then you really need to do the cars because that's, I forget what bus contributes, under 3% maybe of carbon or something to the transport system. I forget what. So yeah, it'd be great to get, really want to get that out of the system, but that's that's not the huge prize. And and then how do you actually physically, how do you manage it in a way which works with people's lifestyles, which is obviously why I can see that hydrogen involves a lot less fundamental shift in behaviours for all its technical for all its technical issues uh but but yeah I and mean, i don't know what the answer will be to that but i but i do know that the people who are working on this are very concerned about it the low carbon team i mentioned is actually a joint effectively a joint unit between transport scotland and also energy policy so it's actually low carbon economy directorate and they are very tightly plugged into the people who worry about generation and networks and, and so on that's quite useful because I have written papers through our, um, I'm an engineer, by the way, um, written papers through IM MSP and to the various transport units and they just ignore ignore any correspondence, which doesn't really help wider um, sort of understanding. Now, as a slight follow on to that, which is a question I sort of did uh, let Emma and um, Rachel, Rachel know, it's to do with funding. Um, one of the problems we have, um, we're a purely voluntary group and for example, in us, but it affects other people. Funding to replace vehicles is next to impossible to obtain. I've just had yet another turn down for a replacement vehicle. And at the end of the day, if we don't have a vehicle, there's none of the services get run. And we're all, whenever we put an application in, the first thing we come back and say is, you, we're not funding vehicles, not funding vehicles. So at the moment, we can run quite happily with reasonable, good quality secondhand vehicles, which will last a long time. But in four or five years' time, we're going to be forced to go electric, for, or largely electric or alternative fuel. And there's absolutely no way we're going to be able to afford them because at the moment we can buy a second-hand petrol or diesel for fifteen, twenty thousand pounds and it'll last it'll run for ten years. But unless we can still run those, um, we're going to be paying hundred thousand plus for an equivalent electric vehicle when they become available. Um, so there's there's a major problem, and I'm not necessarily saying that the government should fund fund these, but they should encourage, or it would be helpful if they encouraged other funders to think more broadly about their attitude to funding replacement vehicles for community groups. And without wit, and that is the one thing that the vast majority of rural community groups need to provide services is transport. And if we can't get funding to buy vehicles or procure them without an awful lot of effort, then it's, nothing happens. Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, who's who's said, telling you they don't fund vehicles? All the people that we're eligible to apply funding, to apply for funding. Yeah. Now that's done I mean, through the crazy. SCVO, the you know voluntary organisations, uh, things that are around, and all the other funding groups and things. You know, okay. awards for all, for example, the lottery don't touch anything like that so and those yeah. are things that we can normally access and it's just a, and we've just the part of the recovery fund that was just announced um they didn't say anything about what they're restricting so we sit and we put put an application together three months later they come back and say oh we don't fund vehicles you know, okay that's a bit irritating if, they, yeah. if that was always the Happy case the um, i mean i think i mean for my probably we did some years ago there was a there was a one-off vehicle 
thing. Uh, we happened to have some money. I think we in social uh, third sector colleagues had some money and we ran one. We were. I was going to, I was going to refer to that actually because yeah, we uh, we applied. And I've got the figures back saying that I think there was about a million pounds or something available for, from recollection. And you sounds about right. You only you serviced, I think, about 30 applicants. And in total, there are about 80 or 90 applicants. So really, for no more than three times that amount, you could have serviced everybody. And they'd just still be running with the same vehicles now. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to get, I mean, we were very strongly advised, including, I think, by Rachel's predecessor, probably, that you need to be quite careful how you target this funding, because there had been previous experience of, of vehicle funds where a lot of minibuses have been bought to a lot of groups, some of which were frankly not very well used. I'm not saying your group was in that position, and I'm not saying there weren't good applications to the £1 billion fund that weren't met. But what there are also when you run this sort of a fund is not very good applications. So, you know, very shiny minibus that gets used once a week. So there was quite an emphasis on trying to make sure these were going to be good cases. Having said that, that was then. Uh, the other thing, I suppose, which doesn't help you at all, but is from my perspective on all this, is that the cost of having a vehicle available for use and so on is really part of the cost of providing the service. So whoever is paying for your services, uh, and that, be it the people who use them, or be it the local authority or whoever, ought to be prepared to pay the price of maintaining the, maintaining the capital. I mean, you know, you have, I've been a treasurer of a tennis club before. We got to a point where we were running out, we never course needed replacing. Everybody was running around saying, can't we apply for grants? No, you know, you're supposed to raise subs that will build the money to replace the. Having said that, I accept that that's not an easy solution because that takes you back into this resource funding question, which everybody is short of. So local government and us. But in theory, if we want your services, there is a cost of providing them. Part of that cost is the cost of the capital. Uh, and somebody ought to be prepared to pay for that. And if they're not prepared to pay for that, then the service obviously can't be afforded and that, you know. So I don't I'm not ruling out funding for vehicle vehicle replacement, but I think they also the costs of the service need to be, you know, need to take account of that. And the people who pay for it need to know that and be prepared to pay for it or prepared to explain why not. Sorry. Thank you. The difficulty in that is that a lot. It, if you're trying to meet a social objective, then you've it's got to be affordable. And yes, we we could charge, but we'd end up having to charge people four to five times what they do at the moment to yeah. take the service. And you just people just won't do it. It's, you know, it's as simple as that. I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to cut in there. We've got eight minutes, and we're already <laughs> seven minutes over. So we'll be hitting an hour at eight minutes. Sorry, Either, do you want to, no, no. No, I sorry. It's a, it's a really important conversation, um, and and a bit of me thinks Nick is going to drag you into it after this, Tom. So let's let's move on to the next. Drag away somewhere, but yeah. Um, so we have two questions left. Um, so first, I'm going to come to Kenny, who has a question about transport to help. And then to Don, who has a question about car schemes. So Kenny, in about three and a half minutes, if we could ask your question. No pressure, Emer. Thank you for that. I'll do it in 90 seconds. Kenny, Kenny Duncan from Loathing Community Transport Services. Uh, and this is a very uh, prosaic, practical question based on the resources that, that we actually currently have, uh, but, but some of the challenges that we've got in terms of service delivery. Was delighted to see uh, the inclusion of the requirement to work with CTs in the, the, the Transport Scotland Act. Um, I think one of the challenges that, that a number of CTs, including the very established ones, are actually engaging uh, with health boards in a meaningful dialogue. I think, I think there's a real potential there for a mutual benefit once a, 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 a you know, decent conversation gets started. Um, I, I'm wondering, is there anything Transport Scotland could do? Clearly, it's not your direct remit, but is there something that you could do to facilitate some of those conversations with colleagues uh, and health boards to look at some of the, the, the joint work that we could actually be doing in the health to work area? Yeah, uh, conscious of time, uh, so I'm trying to waffle too much, but the... Uh, the... I, I, you reminded me about the Max for the Mobility Advisory Committee Scotland, who are you know the ministerial advisors on accessibility, have did a report. I forget how long ago now, but uh, basically quite critical of the aspects of how healthcare related transport was provided uh, and various things they wanted done. 
there again, like with a lot of things, has been a bit of a COVID hiatus, but that's picked up again. I think, Rachel, you're probably, I'm told you're plugged into that. I hope you are. Uh, that That is, I think, primarily from where we, we deal with, uh, I suppose you could say, Scottish Government Health Directorates. And then, you know, and the health boards get their lead or don't get their lead from what they're getting from the health directorates. So the Max team and, and my colleagues who support the Max team, I think, are working away on the health side uh, to try and get a better join up there and get, get the healthcare related transport issue up the agenda. I mean, obviously, community transport is part of that mix. Uh, and when we commence the Act, the Act, that provision of the Act isn't, I think, commenced at the moment, but when it is commenced, clearly that will be an additional additional lever to use with them. We've always found it difficult to engage with health boards, I think, on this stuff from where we are. We've tried it in the past. Uh, they've obviously got a lot of other concerns. They've got even more concerns at the moment, although there's obviously some interaction. So it's not like, you know, you can forget this stuff because COVID is going on in some way, something that's more important. But yeah, I think it's low. You need to do it locally. But I think the messaging is certainly, I think health ministers have heard it quite a lot and their officials have heard it more quite re recently. So I think there is room for improvement and I think that's known so we'll push on it but I mean I think you know I like you I'm frustrated I just think we win wins to be had here so it's sort of it is sort of annoying but partly for lack of bandwidth I think they don't get talked about thank you very much Tom um, and quickly we will come to Don who has a question about concessionary travel and care schemes You're muted, Don. Hello. Oh. You're muted. Oh, I can unmute you. There we go. Has that worked? No, no it's not working. Oh, there we go. We're successful there we with go. that. I'm in. Yeah. Yes, it's really about the uh, concessionary bus passes. My name is Don Fraser, and I'm um, based in Killing with a car scheme that covers our village and five other small villages. Uh, very poor or no tra public transport at all. And what, what public transport we do have is inaccessible to anybody who's elderly or infirm. Uh, and on that basis, I'm not able to use the bus passes that they have yet yeah, as a car scheme. Um, we have to charge them rather than them being able to use bus passes. Uh, this flags on to the ambulance service that was mentioned, the passenger ambulance service, that uh, have changed their uh, assessment of needs, which is much more difficult to get access to them. Uh, and that is our main area of work, getting people into hospitals and clinics, um, which are 30, 40 miles away. Uh, and having to uh, charge our passengers who are sitting on a bus pass that uses to them. I just wonder if there's some way of re-looking at this so that um, we could actually reduce the cost of passengers. Okay, I'm on mute. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a good question. The, uh, we, I think our position is that that's, that's better dealt with as a local concessions issue, that the, the whether or not there is a, the value which there is to, to the travel and, and the costs and so on and the need for it uh, is something which we think varies quite a lot from place to place. Uh, and that reason i mean general affordability as well i think we don't think it's uh effective to do a national every, every you know national universal thing equivalent to the thing we do for bus buses sort of uh, sort of constraints if you like on the cost of the bus scheme which we can manage with uh we think it's a decision that's best taken locally locally or regionally uh which is sort of position we're at and that's where the budgets sit and that's where the powers and responsibilities sit i mean i think I'm saying all that, I mean, I think we do, I think we'll probably want to look a bit at this uh, when we're looking at the, or more generally about this local national thing and the role of bus versus other types of transport solution. Uh, when, we, when we're looking at what happens when we come out of, 
when we start to come back out of COVID, because I think the risk is, from a bus policy point of view, that we fund a lot of empty box, large empty boxes uh, running around with not many people on them. I mean, we already do that to some extent in rural areas, but there is a sort of basic connectivity argument. But if a number of people actually using public transport has fallen a lot by that point, you do you do start to have to ask yourself whether we whether we just increase the subsidy for conventional types of public transport or whether we need to look more at you know can demand responsive play a role whether that's third sector demand responsive or even commercial demand responsive it'll still need subsidizing all the stuff we see uh it there are people doing trials and pilots involving sort of uh you know using mass type technologies in it and so on to schedule and all the rest of it uh Quite expensive but it does stuff which you didn't wasn't very easy to do in the old days with pen and paper based booking services and so on so i think we'll come back we'll come back to it i think when we're looking at funding arrangements for the future uh you see maggie ooh, lots of things on chat which i'm probably here for yeah uh yeah no i think i i remember a lot of meetings when i dealt with regional transport partnerships between the rtps and the ambulance service about the fact the ambulance service were being much more picky about who they provided ambulance services for and there was a big shift as i understand it at that time into moving for only to the sort of service which you needed you know actual paramedic support and that did create a big gap uh, and and that was a gap which was essentially i think probably for local government to plug either by providing or subsidizing but obviously, as with a lot of other things, there's a lot of calls on local government funding. So it's not. But we, I don't think we think the concession is the answer. I think it's also fair to us. And there is an issue which we are seeing. And certainly we acknowledge that the more money we spend on concessions, the less money we have available to spend on supporting the existence of services. So, you know, the more concessions there are, the better it is for people who have a service. Uh, the less money there is to provide services for more people. And there's a trade off there. So that's a not very helpful answer to you, but I think we think it's a local authority because we think it differs a lot. I think what's needed in Edinburgh isn't the same as what's maybe needed in, in Bewley or wherever. And we are certainly not in a position to judge that. And we're not particularly wanting to start having to judge that. That's really helpful. Folks, I am afraid we are properly out of time. We are pushed out of our first set of time, out of our second set of time. First, let me just say, Tom, thank you so much for your time and the research that you put in ahead of this. You know, it is really appreciated just to have a better understanding of what's kind of what the rationale is and also what's coming up down the line. So that's really helpful. So thank you as well. Thanks to Ema for pulling all the questions and stuff together. Thanks to all the members who came to the other session and along today. Do put things in the chat. We'll save that. And if there are any questions, we'll send those to Tom. Uh, you'll have received an email from me along with the stuff about this meeting with a survey to send to Suzanne please do fill that in um, and then we can send even more stuff to Tom 